Do you know who I am? Oh, I'm sure that you think you do. But do you have any idea really who I am? Herod the Great, they called me. Some also called me the Builder, and some called me the Butcher. And in truth, I have been both in my life. My father, Antipater I, was governor of all Judea, got his title from Julius Caesar himself. It was a precarious position to rule between the thumb of Rome and the unpredictability of the Jews. Eventually, my father lost his life because he failed to see the threat that was mounted against him by his own people. And I vowed when my turn came, and it would come, that would not be my fate. Just as my father was able to attain his power by aligning himself with the prevailing power in Rome, so when it came time for me, I did the very same thing. At that time, there was civil war in Rome between Mark Antony in the east and Octavian in the west. I had only to bide my time and wait to see which side would win. It was no trouble to align myself with Octavian, who would later declare himself Caesar Augustus. Perhaps you've heard of him. And in 40 B.C., the Roman Senate declared me king of the Jews. King of the Jews. Well, you see, dealing with Rome is really the easy part of ruling. Rome really only cares about two things, taxes and keeping the peace, the Pax Romana. As long as the money is rolling in and there isn't too much trouble in the region, Rome is quite content to leave well enough alone. But the Jewish people? <laughs> they are another matter entirely. You have never met a more quarrelsome, unruly, stiff-necked, stubborn people in your life. Oh, you think I'm a Jew? Well, I was their king, but I've never been one of them. Not really. My ancestors were Arabs of Edomite descent. They converted to Judaism two generations before my time. I am a Jew purely as a matter of pragmatic expediency. I mean, you cannot call yourself king of the Jews if you aren't at least willing to call yourself a Jew. You see, all trouble here in Judea is religious trouble. These people simply cannot distinguish between God and government. And so whatever trouble was going on was always some complicated wrangle involving religious laws or sacred something or other, and people protesting and getting angry, and invariably I had to put someone or some ones to death to quiet the whole thing. Oh, of course, religion has its place, don't get me wrong. But its place is in the service of those in power. Religion, politics, economics, even family, these are but tools in the hands of those who would rule. And that's what I am, a ruler. It's what I was born to do. True kings and rulers, you see, are not divinely appointed by God despite what they tell you. Neither are they descended from other kings. No, true kings and rulers are only those who are willing to do what is necessary to seize and to hold on to power. And I was willing to do what is necessary. I can tell just by looking at you. There's not a one among you who has the strength of character and will to do what I did, to rule as I ruled, under the watchful eye of Rome and over the stubborn hearts of the Jewish people. I know what the history books say about me and my descendants. And to be sure, my sons who ruled after me had all of my flaws and none of my greatness. But for all the evil that is spoken of me, for all the violence done by my decree, and I don't deny it, the Jewish people, and Rome for that matter, have never appreciated my true greatness. They have no concept of my achievements as their king. The palaces and the fortresses that I constructed, no, that I envisioned, rival anything you will see in Rome itself, both in size, scale, and in grandeur. Don't tell me you've not heard of a desert fortress called Masada, rising 1,400 feet above the Dead Sea, an entire mountaintop leveled at my word. 24 acres converted into palaces, courts, baths, mosaics, gardens, the likes of which you can't even imagine. I envisioned that in the middle of a desert. I built that. Or shall I tell you about the largest man-made seaport in all of the Mediterranean? 
in a city I built out of nothing called Caesarea by the sea. Even the very temple of the Jews, their beloved temple, the center of their identity, I rebuilt that. But am I remembered for these things? Am I praised for these things? No. I ruled in a murderous time over a land in constant turmoil under threat of being torn apart by the empires and ambitions of men. The Jews have never understood this. You know, without me, they might not even exist. If it were not for me holding that country together, they would have been torn apart and destroyed by the powers of the day. After all, as I said, I rebuilt their temple, the temple of the Jews. The temple that I built was so grand and marvelous, Solomon couldn't even imagine what I rebuilt. The very foundation stones that I laid are so massive, do you know they're there to this day? In the very same spots? Not even the legions of Rome could remove them. God himself couldn't move them. But I did. I've heard that the Galilean, your Christ, has said that he could rebuild that temple in three days. <laughs> do you know how ridiculous that is? It took 60,000 men and slaves 46 years to accomplish my vision. I've also heard that this Galilean told his followers that faith as small as a mustard seed can move a mountain. Well, let me tell you a little something about moving mountains. The Herodian, the palace fortress in Judea that bears my name, was an exercise in real live mountain moving. In under seven years, I leveled every surrounding hill and constructed my own man-made mountain towering over everything in the countryside. On top of it, placed my palace towers, hollowed out the inside of my own mountain and filled it with mosaics and baths and courts and tunnels, the likes of which the world had never seen before. No, friends, faith does not move mountains. Men do. Men with the courage and vision and strength of character to see it done. Oh, I know there are those who have and will still balk at the cost of such achievements. The cost in terms of taxes and in human life was great. But let me ask you this. What is the point of insignificant lives if not to be sacrificed in service of a greater vision and a grander purpose? My vision. My purpose. Greatness requires great sacrifice. It has always been this way. I'm not the first king, nor will I be the last, to sacrifice a few of his subjects to accomplish great things. This is just the way the world works. If you can't see this, you're a fool. It has always been this way. The lesser things always serve the greater. Common peoples just have no understanding of what's necessary, of what it takes to rule, to reign, and to stay on the throne. You have to face the hard truth, if you're in my position, that to rule is to be alone. You can trust no one. That's the true weight of greatness, and few indeed are able to bear it. You can trust no one, not even those closest to you, not even your own family. In my case, especially not your own family but we won't go into that. Do you have any idea how difficult it was for me to hold that little region of the empire together? The Romans never fully accepted or trusted me because in their minds I was too Jewish. And the Jews would never accept me truly as their king, never surrender their wills to me and to my rule because in their minds I was too Roman. If I wasn't to be loved, then I would be feared. And in my opinion, it's better by far to be feared anyway. If I wouldn't have their allegiance willingly, then I would take it by force, at the end of a sword if necessary. I would do what I had to do. And I was feared. Being king is not for the faint of heart, you see. Few are willing to do what's necessary to make the hard choice without hesitation and without remorse. I've seen whole nations and kingdoms toppled. Do you know why? 
because those who are in power hesitate when the moment comes. They're unwilling to spill blood if necessary, to do what's required, to make the difficult choice. I was willing. I know the prophets say that your Messiah will be a suffering servant, that he'll be a compassionate and merciful king. I learned early in my life that there's no place for weakness in a man who would rule in this world. And compassion is the worst kind of weakness because it masquerades as a virtue. But don't be deceived. It is weakness. Compassion is weakness. And it will get you killed, stabbed in your sleep, or poisoned in your own court. There's no place in a king's heart for compassion. I've also heard your Christ claim that his kingdom is not of this world. <laughs> I would have told you that's lies. Nothing but honey-coated lies. This world, this life, is all there is. This is the only kingdom that exists. But you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You've got your kingdoms. You've got your little spheres of influences. The places in your life, your businesses, your families, your homes, your, your workplaces, your neighborhoods, the places where you try to exert some control, some influence. I mean, if you don't look out for yourself, who's going to? Who's going to take care of you if you don't take care of you and yours? You know, it's ironic, tragic really, that I should be remembered for a brief conversation I had with those scholars from the East, those pompous stargazers. Who would have thought anything amazing or historic was happening on that day? I was engaged in some important affairs of state when they came to my court, and my court attendant, a nervous fellow with a thin beard who always smelled a bit like sour wine, but competent enough and loyal, came and announced that scholars from the East had arrived. Now, it was not at all unusual for traveling dignitaries or wealthy merchants to come to the palace to pay their respects. What was unusual is that I knew nothing at all about these men or the reason for their visit until this meeting, and my border spies would have to answer for that. After the usual niceties and diplomatic uh, sayings, they got right to the point. They said to me, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We have been following his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Can you imagine the outrage, the indignation, my shock? Where's the one born king of the Jews? You're looking at him. I'm king of the Jews. How dare you come to my palace and ask where the king is? But I perceived right away there was more going on here than I was aware of. So I swallowed my rage, offered them wine, and we plied them with many questions. After a while, they left to refresh themselves, and I called a meeting of all the scholars and priests to come and tell me where this king was to be born. And they told me that the traditions and the prophets said, that the Messiah, king, was to be born in Bethlehem, of all places. It's a nothing village. I told these wise men, these magi, go and make a search for the child. And when you find him, and after you've worshipped him, come, report back, because I too want to meet my successor. I too want to bow before the next king of the Jews and worship him. Worship. The very word makes me choke. What, what is worship but the grudging acknowledgement that another is greater and more powerful than you? Ritual, sacrifice, offerings, these things are just tools to be used in the hands of those who have power to control those who are lesser than them. I could never understand why someone would willingly bow, bow down before another person unless they were forced to do so. I bowed before Caesar, not because I loved him, but because if I did not, I would lose everything. That's the only kind of worship I know. And I will never bow before someone lesser than I, certainly not some babe from Bethlehem. 
when I finally heard that the Magi had found the child and left my borders without reporting back, undetected, I was angry. But I will admit at the same time, I was nervous. What if? What if they had found some new ruler? What if they had found one that was born to rule and to reign? You know the story. I'm sure you've heard it and told it many times. It's been passed down through the ages. It's told to this day. The Jews hoped for a Messiah. They longed for a Messiah, a deliverer, a king in the line of David, someone to save God's people. Now, I don't believe in fairy tales, and I certainly didn't believe that a real Messiah had actually shown up in my kingdom at this time. But I also knew that desperate longings in the human heart, religious fervor, fervor and wild rumors could cause very real trouble for me. And so I had to act. I mean, if strangers from the east would travel hundreds of miles to worship a child they'd never met, what would happen when his own people heard about this? I could admit to you that I felt threatened by the very idea of this child. I mean, if he, if he was the Messiah, the actual Messiah of God, then my days on the throne would be numbered. But I knew better. There's no Messiah. There's no deliverer. There's no other kingdom. There's only this bloody struggle of a life and whatever you are able to scratch and claw out of it for yourself. But I still could not shake the uneasy feeling. You see, my reign was based on fear and control. And if one ever came, Messiah or not, who was able to stir the people's affections, and if they would serve him out of love, then I knew how quickly my reign could end. I knew all too well how fast that could happen. I'd seen it happen to my father. Now, I did not know, mind you, or even believe that anything had actually happened in Bethlehem. But what was the difference? I couldn't afford to take that chance. I had to destroy him. I had to use the power that I had to work for me while I still had it. I had to protect myself. I mean, even if it was imaginary, it didn't really matter, did it? It didn't matter what I thought or who I believed this child was. It mattered what they thought, who the people believed he was. And so I gave the order. I know to you, it seems like a hideous crime, an unthinkable thing, the slaughter of the innocents, it's been called. I suppose it was. But it was no worse than kings and rulers have always done to keep power. I simply did what I had to do. I am not the first, nor am I, will I be the last, to take a few lives in order to stay on the throne. The truth is that I was threatened and fear makes you do strange things, doesn't it? Do you ever feel threatened? I'm asking you, do you ever feel threatened? You should. We, all of us, use the power at our disposal, don't we? Oh, you don't think you would have done what I did? Really? Have you ever resented another person's power or position in life? Have you ever felt the twist of jealousy in your heart at another person's success? Ever wanted to rid yourself of someone just to be done with them? Oh, you wouldn't think of murder? Of course not. But you use the power at your disposal. Words that slip from your lips to color the truth to make yourself look better and someone else less? Gossip cleverly disguised as genuine concern to slight someone you're tired of, the cold shoulder, the rejection, a tongue that twists the truth just a bit. Don't tell me that the seeds of fear and resentment don't lurk in your heart. I know they do. You're a lot more like me than you're willing to admit. There is a little bit of me in every one of you. In the end, if we're honest, 
We all do what we have to do to survive. And I was right about one thing. He is threatening. Make no mistake about it, friends. You too must face him. You too must decide what you will do with the Christ child. You and Jesus cannot both be Lord. Those areas of your life you're trying to control and exert your lordship over, you have to make a choice. You feel insecure. You know, I've seen your Christmas celebrations. The lights, the feasting, the gift giving, and the singing. But lurking beneath all of that, if you're honest, is a very dangerous message. A new king has been born. A new king making claims over your life has been born. What will you do with him? How will you respond to him? I made my choice, and now I am condemned to the truth. I see the truth now. The babe that escaped my murderous plots would grow to become a man. A man who had all power in the universe and would lay it down to save the powerless. How unthinkable. You must face the same truth. The only question is, will it be a truth that you have lost out of self-worship or a truth that you have gained out of surrender? A truth that has saved you or a truth that has condemned you? I really have only one thing left to say to you. You can have only one king. In the end, we all make a choice. And you must choose to either bow down and surrender your life in worship to this king or quit the charade and get rid of him altogether. It's one or the other. You can have only one king. Every one of us must choose who our king will be. I made my choice. Who will be your king?